Hi, I'm Will Webb, and this is Why You Should Watch. In this episode, we're discussing Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger's 1946 film, A Matter of Life and Death. I was lucky to get you, June. Can't be helped about the parachute. I have my wings suit anyway, big white ones. I hope they haven't got all modern. I'd hate to have a prop instead of wings. What do you think the next world's like? I got my own ideas. Peter. This wartime fantasy drama follows Peter, an RAF pilot who falls in love after cheating death. He enters into a legal battle with heaven for his right to carry on living. Or so it seems. I spoke with film critic Laura Venning to find out why you should watch A Matter of Life and Death. Weirdly enough, I think the first time I saw this, a long time ago, I was still at school. I think it was a kind of end of term Christmas treat, maybe. You know, you watch a film in a lesson and uh, normally it's probably a situation in a lot of schools. There are kind of a very small handful of stock DVDs or videos that would get brought out every time. Um, but one teacher, I think it was an English teacher, had made a special effort and had brought in this, um, which, I mean, it's such a great choice for kind of, the teenagers, I think, kind of uh, looking to expand their horizons beyond kind of mainstream cinema, because obviously it is incredibly watchable, so entertaining, but so incredibly visually bold and fascinating from the get-go. Um, I remember, you know, a class of like, I mean, fairly rowdy, disruptive teenagers being pretty transfixed by this. Um, uh, and I, yeah, I remember being fascinated by it um, and then kind of going down that rabbit hole of watching the other, the other archers or at least the kind of the most famous of them. Um, and it's just a film that kind of turns up over and over again somehow. It's such a significant piece of of cinema, particularly kind of British cinema. Um, and I find myself returning to it a lot, kind of multiple times a year, I will revisit this. I know it back to front. Um, and yet it is always such a pleasure to revisit it. And it always feels almost as amazing as seeing it for the first time, I feel, yeah. It's funny enough, just before you kind of emailed back saying you'd pick this film, I'd actually uh, gotten ready to book tickets for a screening of this at the Prince Charles. They're doing, um, a big screen screening, which I think would be lovely to see now. And I was really amazed by how kind of luscious the film is. So it's no wonder that it kind of caught the attention of a group of teenagers. When you said school, I thought maybe you were like eight year olds or something, which I think might have been a bit difficult. No, no, we were, I think it must have been in sixth form. So old enough to really kind of, uh, to really engage and appreciate it. And you're right. It's sort of like just about educational enough to kind of stick on for a bunch of kids. Um, I know that when I was a kid, we would if people were given the choice, it was usually either Shallow Hal or Panic Room. <laughs> Somehow we were allowed to watch Panic Room. I don't know why that was kind of past the census, but there you go. I was really struck by that very um, well-balanced kind of sense of is it real or isn't it, which I often find infuriating, I have to say, in films. But I think here is done in, a, in almost like a kind of jovial way. It's sort of like, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I promise it's not your heaven, whoever's heaven it is, kind of version of heaven. And I think that's the closest I got to seeing this film before watching it just now. So I hadn't seen this. Oh really? Wow. I'd seen The Red Shoes and weirdly Tales of Hoffman, which is not a very well watched um, Pal and Pressburger. But the thing that really struck me kind of about this was just how much of it I knew kind of as osmosis, especially in terms of showing heaven. I think it's a really big, important depiction of heaven, although I don't think it is supposed to be heaven yeah i think it's amazing and so incredibly british to open with this kind of gorgeous fantastical sequence but we're going to slip some humor in there we're going to we're going to essentially open with a joke um and have that very very proper very british but quite sort of warm and friendly voiceover guiding us through the universe um you know i think the first the first line of the film is this is the universe big isn't it it's just so it's so incredibly charming and british and taking something enormous uh, and and majestic, but also making it very small and kind of funny and a bit tongue in cheek at the same time. I think it's just wonderful. And I wonder how that would have felt watching it in the cinemas for the first time when it came out, because of course, most films then were preceded by informational short films. So, you know, you've gone straight from that to something that's almost in the same register, but also very fantastical. Listen to all the noises in the air. Yes, but they're by Request your position. Request your position. Come in, Lancaster. Come in, Lancaster. Position mill. Repeat mill. Age 27. 27. You get that? That's very important. Education interrupted. Violently interrupted. Religion. Church of England. Politics. 
Conservative by nature, Labour by experience. What's your name? And then the film jumps quite quickly into this really quite emotional, tough conversation between these two uh, kind of points in the night, which is Kim Hunter as June, the American romantic lead, and of course David Niven as the lead character. And I was really struck by how contemporary that felt. It still feels like a very um, emotional and sensory beginning to a film, especially for a period of film, I think, sometimes wrongly, that we kind of think of as being very dry. No, absolutely. I think you really feel the, the tragedy and the kind of violence of it, even though obviously, you know, he's going down in this kind of glorious, almost kind of self-sacrificing. It, it, it ties into the kind of the romance. I think particularly the romance of the pilot. Um, I was reading all about kind of how the RAF pilots sort of being aligned with the idea of like a medieval knight, like there's this idea of British sort of honour and chivalry and it, it ties into that. But yeah, that, that kind of fireball he's descending into, it's it's genuinely quite, yeah, the horrifying um, and quite a sort of intense, yeah, surprisingly violent depiction of war from the get-go, um, even though, you know, he's also quoting like Andrew Marvel and, and all this kind of beautiful romantic poetry, yeah. He- and that shot immediately after of his friends in heaven sitting and waiting for him. And all these people kind of streaming in kind of really gives you a sense of, of what Powell and Pressburger are, I think, slightly subversively saying about war in that opening there, where it, there's something kind of glamorous about it, but also kind of sad. There's some, some very young men coming through that door. Yeah, just the scale of the tragedy and little baby Richard Attenborough's very youthful face. And, oh, it's... Break it up, spread out here. Room and back. Oh, uh, do you have your social shows here? No, we don't. Okay, we'll stay. So then you get the first kind of depiction of national identity, which ends up being a really important thing in that film, I think. And the first thing they do is run to the Coke machine that Heaven has, apparently, which I love. There's this kind of um, portrayal of Americans throughout as being like rambunctious schoolboys, but sort of infectiously so, like in a nice way. It's not completely looking down on them. And I was also interested to see some Sikh soldiers in the background as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm really jumping the gun here, but particularly towards the end of the film, it's it's amazing how bold and surprising it is that it really it's a it's a portrayal of a whole world. It's really not just limited to kind of the white American and the white British kind of experience. Um, yeah, and you you get the first kind of the first sort of hint of that uh, towards the beginning. It, it's it's a huge theme throughout the film. Um, but yeah, very fascinating. And I think the way, it, yeah, it plays with the kind of the stereotypes we kind of still have us Brits still have about Americans <laughs> and that there is this huge cultural difference. And yet, like, you're right, it is also quite affectionate. It kind of acknowledges the cultural stereotypes um, and plays into them. Yeah, but in a way that I think is quite is quite affectionate. Um, and you have that similar moment as well, where I think it's a, a French um, airman comes in with with a very very British kind of officer, and he kind of like demonstrates how he died, like in French, and the and the British officer something like, oh, you know, bad luck, old boy. And it's it's this very sweet, very kind of silly sort of unity that's actually it's very endearing as much as it obviously plays into these these huge stereotypes <laughs> my expectation of the film was that it'd be sadder than it was and actually i was kind of surprised to find that it's it's much warmer and more comedic than my understanding of it was and particularly you have Mario scoring as conductor 71 this kind of hysterical french stereotype i think is pretty fair to say it's fascinating to me that Mario scoring really lobbied for the role of um, peter and they said, no, sorry, you will be the comedic French fop. You absolutely cannot play our romantic lead. I almost can't fully get on board with him in the red shoes. It's, sorry, Mario scoring, because for me, he will forever be this character. I cannot really take you seriously as kind of this young, young composer. But, um, but yeah, because he just owns this role absolutely, and I love it. And how are you, my friend? I've never been better. June, wake. She cannot wake. We are talking in space, not in time. Are you cracked? Look at your watch. It has not moved since you said so charmingly, drink, darling, nor will it move, nor will anything move until we have finished our little talk. 
And so that's heaven. And of course, a lot of the film takes place on Earth uh, in glorious Technicolor, which is famously uh, in short supply in heaven. And I was really interested by how, like, like I've said before, kind of how contemporary and lively some of that stuff felt. In particular, there's lots of very fast motorbike filming in it, which I think was pretty difficult to do at the time with the size of the cameras they were using. And also there's a lovely sequence where they're playing ping pong and the camera's whipping back and forward really quickly, all of which feels quite fresh, I think, even now. Those, those sequences are still so visually striking, even the kind of you know, when they freeze and that wonderful moment where Peter's having, he thinks he's having a dream and he stands up and kind of like runs into this table and all the books go onto the floor and, and, and don't make a sound. And of course it's, it's the simplest thing in the world. And yet it is so, it's so effective and it so feels so genuinely magical. Yeah. The, sim- the simplest trick in the world. And obviously that beautiful Technicolor is so, um, you know, it's fascinating because obviously logically heaven would be in glorious technicolor because that's where you want to be in humdrum mundane earth would be in black and white but obviously this is a film that really that that was released at a moment where you know the transition between war from wartime to peacetime and i feel that it it's simply what you know when it comes down to it we want life on earth to 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 feel like it's worth living so it that has to be in glorious technicolor you know it's heaven is this it's a it's a utilitarian place it's 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 ordered and it's and it's quite welcoming and comforting um it's not something to be afraid of but equally we want to be on earth with the beautiful pink rhododendron flowers and the beach and um and we want to be able to play ping pong and drive on motorbikes through the village you know it's it's the space where we want to be and it's it's so beautiful it just it works so perfectly What about him? Lincoln. No, it's hardly fair to drag him in. I don't believe he'd be prejudiced. Plato. How would you like to be defended by Plato? Nobody knew more about reasoning than Plato. He was 81 when he died. He might be too old to think love important. Do you think so? I definitely think one of the most striking and memorable and also just appropriately most famous scenes is there is this stairway between earth and heaven uh and it's this enormous a, a sort of like a constantly moving almost like an escalator but on a huge scale and it is lined with these enormous statues of kind of great figures from history uh so you've got kind of socrates and plato and all these kind of these giants and uh, and Peter sits on the stair with Conductor 71, who is trying to encourage him to choose who he might select to represent him in this heavenly court. You know, he can have anyone in heaven at all. Um, and this stairway is gradually moving further and further and further close to heaven. And Peter starts to think, hmm, maybe you're maybe you're just keeping me distracted. You're trying to keep me on this stairway and keep me talking as long as possible. And before I know it, I'm going to be at the top of these stairs and you've you've sneaked me into heaven without me even realizing. And it's just it's really it's it's technically an incredibly uh just visually incredible image uh, but it's also just a wonderful scene of kind of basic human drama of uh, of one character kind of manipulating another and it's it's just brilliant stuff absolutely and i think that it, it does showcase something that we haven't actually spoke, spoken about that much which is that the really kind of groundbreaking effects work on the film a lot of the effects they were using were well established but i think they in particular use matte paintings in a really interesting way and i you know, this is a time where computer graphics obviously doesn't exist. Uh, there isn't even really the kind of like mechanical um, printing graphics that are used on things like Star Wars, the first Star Wars films. And you, what you really have to do is just paint a huge background. So there are these massive fabric backdrops with painted backgrounds on them. And a lot of those don't look great because they're trying to be used in a realistic way. And in these films, uh, as in Black Narcissus as well, uh, and, in, and in Red Shoes, they really don't care that they're painterly and they'd rather they were painterly to some extent. So you end up with these very stylized matte paintings, which combined with really clever use of uh, real world props. That escalator is actually a gigantic escalator, apparently in real life. It took about three months to build, cost like 3000 pounds in 1940s money, a really huge uh, job, which is kind of mad. I'm sure you know this already, but I heard that I read that the, uh, the escalator was nicknamed Ethel. 
which I love. That actual scene that you've discussed, they didn't use any dialogue that was shot on set because it was so colossally loud. Colossally loud. Yeah. Love that so much. (laughs) But I was also interested to find out that this was the first royal film performance. Yeah, fascinating. An interesting choice considering that uh, it's quite explicitly anti-imperialist surprisingly considering it's a it's a film very much about british identity and it doesn't it it, it's clearly very proud of its britishness but it has this it has this really anti-imperialist undercurrent which is makes it i think so striking particularly to us as a modern audience um, and very unusual for the time so yeah really fascinating and we should probably just explain a, a royal film performance is basically when the royal family gets sat down to watch a film and tickets are sold to it for charity so i think that means that you have to pick something that's generally crowd pleasing uh, and also feels quite big in a way you know you have to kind of think about something that's safe to sit the queen down and watch and it's just the weirdest thing when you kind of think that they sat and watched die another day in 2002 like it just seems like a terrible idea that is one of the sacrifices you have to make as a royal you have to sit through you know it's no choice of your own Sorry for going off on a tangent about the Queen and her film taste. Um, thank you so much, Laura, for, for kind of checking in and recommending the absolutely lovely A Matter of Life and Death. Um, and would you recommend, again, some of your writing? You can find me uh, in various different places, um, but I've written for Girls on Tops, I've written for Little White Lies, and uh, most regularly doing reviews for The Digital Fix. Um, and you can find me on Twitter if you just search my name, Laura Benning. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video. To hear more of our conversation, check out the Indie Tricks podcast. Just search Indie Tricks wherever you listen to podcasts to get started.